is so good to be here, to be able to come for a time of worship together. During this month of October and last month, we were starting to look at creation, God's good world, with a view to the fact that we've got this big conference heading in our direction, well, in Glasgow's direction in November. It's good to remind ourselves just how good God is and his wonderful creation, the wonderful things that he did and put in place for us. So we're going to start this morning by singing together, and it's Let Us With a Gladsome Mind, and we can remain seated as we sing. Loving God, we thank you for the beautiful world that you have given us. We thank you for the blessings, a world packed with resources, a world packed with food for all. Forgive us, Lord, when we just take that for granted. Forgive us when we don't share and people go hungry while we throw food away. Forgive us, Lord, when we don't appreciate the beauty and the precision of your world. Forgive us, Lord, when we just continue our ordinary everyday lives without even giving it a second thought. For you are a great and mighty God. You are abundant in all things. You have poured out your love upon us. So forgive us, Lord. And give us hearts that appreciate. Appreciate you, appreciate your creation, appreciate one another, appreciate our beautiful, beautiful world. And as we come today to worship you, Lord, may we know your spirit close to us, leading us, guiding us, opening our eyes to the wonderful things that you have done in your creation, opening our eyes to the things that you are still doing, And we pray, Lord, that during this time here, we really will have an encounter with you, drawing close to you, understanding your word in ways that we never have before. 
we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. So we're back at the very beginning of the Bible, at that time of creation. We've moved on a little bit from like the Garden of Eden. And this is a very, very familiar passage because it's about Noah. And on Sunday, we were covering Noah's Ark. And there's the Ark. It was having a bit, it was on the, on the crest of a wave on Sunday morning. That's why it kind of looks as if it's halfway in the air for the storm that was coming in. And the passage says, Noah was 600 years old when the flood came on the earth. He and his wife and his sons and their wives went into the boat to escape the flood. A male and a female of every kind of animal and bird, whether ritually clean or unclean, went into the boat with Noah, as God had commanded. Seven days later, the flood came. When Noah was 600 years old, on the 17th day of the second month, all of the outlets of the vast body of water beneath the earth burst open. All the floodgates of the sky were opened, and rain fell on the earth for 40 days and nights. On that same day, Noah and his wife went into the boat with their three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jepheth, and their wives. And with them went every kind of animal, domestic and wild, large and small, and every kind of bird. A male and a female of each kind of living being went into the boat with Noah, as God had commanded. Then the Lord shut the door behind Noah. Amen. I don't know about you, but there are certain... I'm not, I'm not great with plants, okay? And it's possibly because I forget to water them and plants need to be watered. But there are certain plants that even when I, I, I try very, very hard, I don't seem to have any success with. I went to visit a lady one day, and she had this beautiful plant in a, a kind of a redundant fireplace in our living room. It was huge, and it was full of blooms. And I couldn't believe my eyes because it was a very huge one of these, poinsettia that we normally see at Christmas time. However, this was July. It was huge, and she said she'd had it for three years. It was really growing well. And I couldn't get my head around this because the longest I've managed to keep one alive is February. And I've looked at all kinds of things. You get advice about, oh, put a black bag over it and put it in a cupboard under the stairs. How does that help? I don't know. I've seen all this kind of stuff. And I think they're beautiful, beautiful plants. But usually by the time we're getting into the beginning of the year, all of the little red um, leaves have come off and it just looks dire and it shrivels up. And am I overwatering it? Am I underwatering it? Is it too hot, too cold? Who knows? But for some reason, this lady had managed to keep this plant alive and it was thriving in those conditions. In our beautiful world, God told us to look after it. If we look a little bit further on in the story, God tells us that the, 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 the rains are coming. Noah's got to get inside the boat. And further still, when the floods have gone, we find out that Noah was indeed a farmer and looked after the land. And in this particular story, it has to be said that there's an awful lot that's tradition. Those of you that were listening when I was talking about this kind of thing the other day will know that there's some things that the Bible doesn't actually say, but we think it does. For example, there aren't, it didn't say that there were three wise men. 
But we assume that there were three wise men because we've got Christmas carols that tell us that there were, you know? So some things come from Scripture and some things come from tradition. What we do know from Scripture is we were meant to look after our good world. And we do know from looking around us that our weather is getting more and more severe. And have you noticed that when these terrible things happen, when it floods, we hear the newsreaders or the weather men, women saying it was of biblical proportions, referring back to this passage that we were reading today. Now, I didn't read the whole passage about Noah because it's a very long one. But the story that you will all have remembered from when you were kids and when you were at Sunday school and the songs that we sang, Mr. Noah built, a, built an ark, the people thought it such a lark. Mr. Noah pleaded so, but into the ark they would not go. That is not in Genesis. It's not there. The tradition comes later on. All it says in Genesis is that, that Noah was a good man, a godly man, that God told him to build a boat and told him to take his wife and, son, his, and his sons and their wives and t- uh, different kinds of animals, get them all in there because it's going to flood and it's really going to flood. That's what it says. There's no Mr. Noah pleading with everybody to get in. There's no people laughing at him. It doesn't actually say that. So where do we get these traditions? Where does it come from? Some of it we pick up little hints of in the New Testament. In the New Testament, for example, in the second book of Peter, when he talks about Noah, he says that he was a preacher of righteousness. Now, I don't think for one minute that means he was like John the Baptist, you know, turn or burn, but it does look as if he was a godly man. You also hear these stories that it took him 120 or 150 years to build the ark. The Bible doesn't say that either. In fact, it would be a massive misinterpretation to say that it does. But we do get a sense from the way that Jesus talks that just like today, people carry on with their lives ignoring any of the warnings that come. So what do we make of it all? Well, I would say to you that the flood story, and that's um, somebody built the ark in our day and age to the proportions that it says in the Bible, so it wasn't just a wee rickety wee thing with a few animals on. It was huge, absolutely huge. Every single religion... And the regions around where this flood story was set all have a flood story. They all have it in there. Whether it was just a particular region that was flooded, because let's face it, in ancient times, that was their world, their whole world. Who who knows? But what we do know is that something must have happened for it has been told all the way across the ancient times. Other people would say, well, would God actually destroy this beautiful world? Is he so vindictive that because people weren't worshipping him, he would just destroy them all? It certainly goes against what we hear of God's nature, what the Lord Jesus Christ said, And certainly in ancient times, if anything terrible happened, it was a punishment from God. If a poor woman found that she couldn't have children, then she was being punished by God. That was the the way, the the worldview of the ancient times. (laughs) However, if God didn't cause the flood, he didn't stop it either. And it's just like nowadays when I often hear Christians saying, we don't have to worry too much about all this climate stuff because God wouldn't destroy this wonderful world. He feels too much for it. And if anything does happen, we'll be all right because we're Christians. 
And I have to say, well, God warned in the past about the flood. He told Noah. And while Scripture doesn't say that Noah went and told everybody to get in the boat, I can't believe for one minute that if he was making something that size, that his neighbors wouldn't have asked what he was doing and why. I would have done if somebody started doing that in the garden next to me. So I can't believe for one minute that the local people at least didn't know that Noah felt there was going to be a flood. And we haven't got Noah today, but we do have teams of scientists around the world who have been warning us for many, many years. And so I'm going to put it in a slightly different way. God told us to look after this brilliant world. He told us from the beginning of time. And if we don't, there are consequences. Nature takes care of the consequences. And whatever caused the flood back in Noah's day, the reality is something cataclysmic happened. And what we know for a fact from that passage is that people had ignored God and had ignored the beautiful world and weren't living God's way and weren't being the stewards of the world that God asked them to be. And so maybe we should be saying, here we are again, that humanity must bear the consequences if we ignore what God tells us and ignore the people that he gets to warn us as well, we've got to expect the worst will happen. And it's not enough for us to simply just say, oh, well, you know, the weather's definitely different from, from what I can remember, or, or I remember a bad winter one time. We can all have these individual weather events. But what we're seeing now in other parts of the world is frightening. Even the astronomers that look into space, they're even noticing that the world doesn't shine as brightly as it used to. What is that all about? How would they know? Are they up there taking a picture? No, 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 no. But they do watch. They watch the reflections on the dark side of the moon. And light is reflected off the, from the sun off the clouds. And the world is growing darker because the clouds, the cloud cover, isn't what it used to be. Can you remember years and years ago we were being warned about the ozone layer? And for such a long time, we've been warned about carbon dioxide and carbon capture. And yet we kind of glibly think, well, it's somebody else's problem. Many, many years ago, I said the scientists are going to have to work something out because people are too comfortable with their cars and their way of life. But every single one of us is going to have to start playing a part, even if it's just making sure that we recycle. Every single one of us is going to have to start listening to what politicians are saying and be careful how we vote. Because our planet was a wonderful gift from God. And we really need to look after it. The planet is more important than somebody trousering lots of money through their business. The planet is not just the future for us, it's the future for those yet to come. Our youngsters are getting scared, and rightly so, because I often hear people say to me, oh, well, you know, things will be fine in my lifetime. Yeah, but what about all of our youngsters? What does the future hold for them? So if God told Noah, I believe he's telling us. He's telling us to listen. This big climate conference is coming to our country, a couple hours drive away, is telling us to listen. And he's telling us to put pressure on our leaders as much as we can 
to start making a difference. It's important. This is God's good world. And he gave it to us, not just for our generation, but for every generation to come. Let us pray. Loving God, today we particularly pray for our planet, for this good world and all that is in it. Lord, we pray that we would heed the warnings before it's too late, that we wouldn't find ourselves in the position of Noah, that we would indeed play our part and do all that we can. Lord, we pray for every single nation, for many are being ravaged much more than ours. We pray for all of the things that are going on in our world right now, that are hitting people's livelihoods. And Lord, we pray for our world leaders because politicians talk and the things that they say seem to be far, far removed from the reality that we live with on a daily basis. And so we pray for an end to that kind of government that people would open their eyes and govern in a godly way, in a way determined by yourself, not by businessmen, in a way that would indeed see justice and equality being brought to the front, in a way where people would be fed from the vast provision that you have given us without people going hungry, that all would be provided for. Lord, we pray for our own families and friends, and we take a few moments of silence in your presence as we name them before you. Lord, we make these prayers in Jesus' name, for we know that you hear us, and we know that you care. Amen. So we're going to close in a moment by singing this lovely hymn, just to let you know that Elevensies will be carrying on. Um, there will, Linda will be taking it next week, and Ewan will be taking Elevensies the week after, which will be a treat for you to have two different people taking it. And it won't be recorded at the time, but there will be a recording online. It'll be different, but there'll be a recording online for people to watch at home that can't come along. So everything will be normal. My techie team is having a couple of weeks off. So there won't be recordings going out. There will be things happening here, but there will be still recordings online for those who can't come along just in case anybody should ask you. So let's close by standing this time and singing together, Angel Voices Ever Singing.
So now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us evermore. Amen.